Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the My Horse University and the Extension Horse Quest live webcast titled Clarifying Learning Theory Terminology in Order to Enhance Fair Horse Training. Our presenter today is Dr. Kami Haleski, an instructor in the Animal Science Department and the coordinator of the Agricultural Technology Horse Management Program at Michigan State University. Dr. Haleski teaches courses in horsemanship, horse selection and judging, equine exercise physiology, horse behavior and welfare, and she supervises student internships. Please note that you are able to ask questions during the presentation using the text chat toward the left of your screen, and we will um, try to answer your questions throughout the presentation, and we'll also have a great deal of time at the end for another question and answer period. The presentation today will be recorded and uploaded to our website if you want to review it at a later date, and at this time I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Haleski. Thank you, Amanda, and it's good to see so many people in attendance today. Um, if you do have questions, as Amanda has mentioned, go ahead and chat them in. I will try to answer questions as we go along. If I get a little bit behind, then we'll have some time at the end where we can answer those as well. So one thing I want to start out with is some real basic fundamental point when it comes to training terminology. And I realize for some of you this is going to be very much review, but I want to kind of make sure we're on the same page as we get started. Um, basically training, we're talking about modifying or shaping behavior and trying to achieve a desirable performance. Some of the main things you want to think about are consistency. When I'm working with new people, trying to get them to use the same cue and have the same expectations of what that cue will elicit. Um, predictability. When you go out to work your horse, are your expectations really high when you get close to a horse show? And then after the horse show, maybe not so high. Um, that might seem like you're being nice, but actually to the horse that's really confusing. Contingency is a big thing. The horse needs the reinforcement to come basically immediately after their response. There's a number of books that will talk about a three second rule. Quite honestly, I think three seconds, if you actually look at your clock and count out three seconds, is actually way too much. Um, maybe if you count one, two, three real fast, that might be more in line with what the horse needs to think of. Um, the appropriateness of the reinforcements, do they make sense in the world of the horse? You know, it might work great for your child to tell them they're not going to get any ice cream. Obviously, for the horse, that really wouldn't make much sense. And then what is the precision of your cue? especially with young horses or horses fairly new in training, that's going to be very important that it's the same cue given at the same location or the same type of voice. Um, once you're dealing with older horses, maybe nice novice lesson horses, then you can be a little less precise, but they will also get a little more casual in their responses as that, that precision goes down. So a couple types of learning before we really get into this terminology issue. Um, one is desensitizing or habituating. And basically that's the gradual decrease of a response to some sort of repeated stimuli. So one area that horses often have a problem with is being a little ear sensitive or ear shy. And if you start when those horses are fairly young and just put your hand on their ear or near their ear, depending what they'll tolerate, and kind of moving that ear around, maybe even giving them a little bit of a massage around the base of their ear, you can desensitize them to something that other horses might find rather offensive. Now on the other hand, sensitization is when you're increasing a response to a stimuli. Um, for example, if you clip a horse and every time your blades get too hot or they're dull, that's going to make that horse really likely to react to clippers. I just want to read this question real quick. Um, the slides will be going into an archived area that you'll be able to access after this talk. Um, and that would be fine to share them with Pony Club. Another type that we talk about is operant or instrumental learning. Basically, the animal learns to operate on its environment to obtain some sort of reward or reinforcement. So kind of a classic example is if you've got um, a pony that learns that every time he manages to manipulate the door lever, he lets himself out and manages to get into the grain, that is one type of operant learning. Obviously not a good situation, but one way to kind of think about it. 
signal learning or classical conditioning, probably the most famous example is Pavlov's dogs. Um, this was a scientist in Russia from a long time ago, and he taught the dogs that if he rang a bell and then shortly thereafter they got some sort of yummy food treat, they eventually would start to salivate just as soon as they heard the bell. They didn't even need to see or smell the food before they would start to salivate. So most of us can think of times where this would apply either to us or to our horses. Now when we're training a horse, I like people always to think in terms of a training pattern. You give some sort of stimuli or cue, the horse makes some sort of response, it might be correct, it might be incorrect, and then you come up with a reinforcement. And in a little bit we're going to talk more about the different types of reinforcement. So as an example, you squeeze your legs while you're riding the horse. The horse walks forward, which is the correct response, you release that pressure, and maybe you say, good boy. On the other hand, if the horse resists and doesn't move at all, that's the incorrect response. And then you might follow up with a heavier type of reinforcement. Um, maybe a little kick with the legs, if you've got spurs on, maybe a little bump with the spurs. When we're thinking in terms of stimuli or cues, if it's unconditioned, this is something that the horse just kind of naturally sees as a reason why it might do something. So for example, if you've got a horse in a round pen and you kind of wave your arms toward the horse, nine out of 10 horses are gonna move away from you naturally. That's just their natural response. So that's an unconditioned type of stimuli. On the other hand, a conditioned stimuli or a conditioned cue might be what a lot of us do when we're lunging a horse is that we use a cluck a to get the horse to trot. Now when you're first teaching the horse to lunge, that clucking noise really doesn't make much natural sense to them. But if you couple that with, say, snapping a lunge whip, um, tapping them on the hind quarter with the lunge whip, that way they start to associate this condition cue, the cluck, with that unconditioned cue, and then eventually the horse is very good at learning that new cue. Um, and you can think of all sorts of examples where we do this with horses all the time. Okay, there's a lot of information on this page, but this in many ways is the most important point that I want to get across during this talk. Um, there are still a fair number of books and bulletins out in publication that don't always use these consistently. So we end up with some confusion. And it's not to say that you can't be a good horse trainer even if you're using these terms incorrectly, but if we can get everybody on the same page using the same terminology, it's going to make us have an easier time of communicating. So when we talk about a reinforcement, if you look at the top, a reinforcement is something that increases the frequency of a certain behavior. On the other hand, when we talk about a punishment, this is something that decreases the frequency of a behavior. So that's a very fundamental point right there. And then in the left column, you'll see positive stimuli. Sometimes this means it's something the horse perceives as positive or pleasurable, maybe a food treat. Or in some cases, it simply means we've added a stimulus. Depending what book you read, what website you read on learning theory, they may use those two different types of positive stimuli. With negative stimuli, this is either something the horse perceives as negative or aversive, something it would kind of like to avoid, or sometimes it just means the withdrawal or removal of a stimulus. So a couple examples, positive reinforcement is a fairly straightforward one. If I'm trying to catch my horse, and it's a little bit challenging to catch, but I start giving it a little food treat every time I'm able to catch the horse, it won't take long before that behavior becomes more and more frequent. So that's a positive reinforcement. Um, much of what we do in horse training is actually negative reinforcement. And so this is where sometimes I get concerned if you start looking on web chats and blogs, Many times they make it out like negative reinforcement is something bad, and, and they're just using negative in that negative way. 
But what this really means is what most horse trainers and horse riders do all the time. Again, for example, if I squeeze my legs and the horse moves forward and then I stop squeezing my legs, that's a very classic type of negative reinforcement. Um, if I'm pulling on a horse, pulling on their halter, putting pressure on their pole, and the horse walks forward and then I release that pressure, that's a very typical type of negative reinforcement. So that that's really one of the big things I want to get across. Negative reinforcement is not automatically bad. Now when we get to punishments, again, we're trying to decrease a behavior here. Now quite honestly, when I'm teaching this class to my horse management students, I normally just lump all the punishment together because it gets very tricky to try to break out positive punishment and negative punishment. The main thing I want people to know is punishment is not automatically a bad thing and that it's going to decrease a behavior. But if I try to split this out, positive punishment, you're adding some sort of stimuli, but you want to decrease a behavior. So if I've got a yearling colt that keeps trying to nip me and I start carrying a dressage whip along with me and bumping him on the chest whenever he tries to nip me, if I do that with correct timing, he's going to gradually decrease how often he tries to nip at me. And the reason I'm using a dressage crop as my example instead of just popping him on the face with my knuckles, um, if you've ever done that, you'll realize it's real easy to create a head shy horse that turns the whole thing into a little bit of a game. Um, negative punishment, I think, is the most confusing one. And quite honestly, I don't find that it works all that well with horses. You know, an example of how this might work is I have a gelding that's very oral. He likes to lip at my jacket. He likes to nibble on my sleeves. He likes to nibble on his lead rope when he's being held through the farrier. Um, he also really likes to have his face scratched. So if I stop scratching his face whenever he gets nippy, that would be an example of negative punishment. Um, you know, we use this with children fairly often. You know, if, if you don't let them get an ice cream cone because they didn't clean their room, that's basically a negative punishment. I haven't seen this work just amazingly well with horses. So I, I will mention that as a little bit of a problem area. So again, some of the information that I really want to bring home. Punishment is not automatically bad. To me, if we're going to keep horses safe, most of the time we're going to occasionally have to use a punishment. Um, and there's some mixed feelings out in the horse training community about that. There are a few people that believe if you're doing everything correctly and use really good timing, you might never have to use a punishment. Um, I guess I've never gotten to the point where I didn't occasionally have to use a punishment with a horse that was just really pushing the limits of what was safe. Definitely a negative reinforcement should not be viewed as something bad. I would say probably 90% of most of the training we do with horses is some sort of negative reinforcement. I would also mention that positive reinforcement maybe does not get used as much as what it should be. There's still a lot of people in the industry that seem to think that positive reinforcement is somehow a bad thing. And if we're using treats or if we're using scratches on the withers, um, that somehow that makes us less of a horseman. And I don't agree with that, but just realize that type of mentality is out there. Now one thing we don't really know, and I have a lot of interesting discussions with other horse trainers and horsemen out there, what sort of reinforcement is the most rewarding to a horse? I think this would make a pretty neat research study at some point. If, for example, you talk to a reigning trainer, they're going to believe that one of the best rewards is for a horse to get to rest after doing a bunch of spins or a bunch of canter work. And probably for how hard a lot of those horses work, that's probably very true. You see that horse stop and they're huffing and puffing. Um, they learn that rest is considered very positive. 
you know, many dressage trainers, when they're working the horse fairly hard, working them on the bit in a fairly collected frame, they will then let that horse have some relaxed time on a long rein. They'll maybe scratch the withers a little bit, and that is also viewed as a positive reinforcement. Some people simply feel release of pressure is enough of a reward. And certainly to a lot of horses, just having the leg pressure taken off or the bit pressure taken off may be viewed as enough of a reinforcement. Um, other times, food treats can be used. It's a little hard to use food treats while we're riding the horse. They've actually developed a bit where you can squeeze a buckle on the reins and have a little bit of molasses dripped into the horse's mouth, but I've never really seen this catch on. So for the most part, we use food treats to reward things from the ground. The other thing you can use food treats for is kind of a secondary, or a, excuse me, a primary reinforcement until they learn that other things are good. So if you're trying to teach a horse that scratching their neck or saying good boy or good girl is a positive, sometimes if you couple that with food, it's a quicker way to get the horse to realize those are positives. We've done some studies where we've found that petting or scratching the horse at their neck and wither area, just like the horses would do if they were out at pasture during a mutual grooming session, that this is very positive. And Laura asked a question, is it similar to clicker training? Um, and it definitely is. You know, my feeling is many of us are doing clicker training. We just don't actually use the clicker and we don't call it clicker training. But Every horse I work with from the time they're young, I want them to associate good boy, good girl, with some sort of follow-up treat, whether that's food or scratching. And so we basically are clicker training. We're just not always using the clicker with us. So with the mutual grooming, they've actually found that that will drop a horse's heart rate when they do that grooming to each other. And so they've done another study with humans scratching that wither area and also found that that drops the horse's heart rate, especially if the horse is in an excitable situation. So this is one thing we're trying to emphasize more and more because wither scratching is something you can do from up on the horse's back. Um, obviously, some horses find it more rewarding than others, but if you watch your horse's responses, you'll be able to get a good idea about this. The other question related to which of these rewards works the best probably has something to do with how we've established our bond with the horse. Um, some trainers just don't ever do food treats, and so maybe release of pressure is very much reward for those horses. Other horses are much more used to the kind words. I've been at some barns where they don't want you talking to the horses at all. So there's all different ways of looking at this, and luckily the horse is very adaptable. So if we're consistent, they seem to be able to figure us out pretty well. A concept that I talk about fairly often in horse training is fairness. And I think most people understand what fairness is, but there definitely are some folks that don't like this term because it's a little bit arbitrary. You know, do horses grasp the concept of fairness? You know, anecdotally, from story standpoint, a lot of us would say that they do. You know, if I, if I have a, one of our horsemanship lesson horses being kind of naughty with a student, and I get on that horse and I have to tune them up a little bit and maybe reinforce them a little more harshly than would be normal, they seem to adapt to that very quickly. Whereas if I would just get on and be completely unfair in my reinforcement of them, I think they would react uh, with some very undesirable behaviors. But again, that's not from a study standpoint, that's more from observations. So also, you know, does the punishment fit the crime? And I don't know if that's a good way of explaining that, but if you have a horse make a small mistake, to me, the way you reinforce that horse or the way you punish that horse should be on a smaller scale. You know, on the other hand, if I have a horse that tries to kick me, um, unless there's some extremely good reason, they're going to get a more severe punishment than a horse that just makes a very small um, mistake. And this is a big one to me, and I don't think 
that a lot of trainers do a sufficient job of this. Does the horse get the option of making a correct choice? To me, the choices need to be clear. The horse needs to get an opportunity to make the right choice so that they can somehow get away from aversive pressure or they can get some sort of reward. So if you are constantly in a horse's face, pushing them up with spurs, and you just go after them, after them, after them, and you don't give them a chance to relax and be correct for a while, in my mind, that's unfair. And sometimes what we can create are conflict behaviors. And we're going to talk a little bit more on the next slide about that. Sometimes we'll also call this evasion or resistance. But if you have a horse, a young horse, let's say, that's confused about why you're putting so much pressure on their mouth, it would not be completely uncommon for that horse to rear up. So that's a horse that's having a conflict and trying to figure out what to do and they end up showing a conflict behavior. And a lot of times these conflict behaviors um, are fairly dangerous. So it can be a pretty big problem. If we've got that horse that we're using a lot of spur pressure and a lot of bit pressure on, and even when the horse is loping along nicely, we keep on them, keep on them, keep on them, that horse may eventually rebel and kick out. It might start bucking. Um, it might get very balky. It may just take a bad attitude. These are all conflict behaviors that might come up. Now, another area that we don't yet know a lot about is this issue of learned helplessness. If that horse is continually given unfair options, and it's sort of like they can never be right no matter what they do, to me, these are sometimes the horses that we see start to look kind of very robotic. Um, they don't show necessarily normal horse behaviors. And there can even be physiological changes that go along with that. Again, we don't have these studies to back us up in horses, but they've done this work in dogs and um, also in rats a number of years ago, quite honestly. And what they did was they subjected the animals to small foot shocks in different situations. So let's take the dogs, for example. The dogs had the opportunity to go back and forth between two different pens. And if the dog had a choice, let's say it jumped into a pen to get a food treat, even though it knew it would get a small foot shock, that dog did not experience this learned helplessness. If, on the other hand, the dog got a small foot shock, no matter what it did, it was just a random schedule of small foot shocks, that dog would eventually just kind of lay there and be blah. And later they found out that the stress hormones of these dogs were just like off the charts. So that's what we refer to as this learned helplessness. Um, and I think you can see why there might be some ethical issues with trying to do this study at this point in time. OK, and Amanda, this is one of the videotapes. This is an example of using negative reinforcement only in an average horse. Um, and it's going to take just a moment for your video to load up, um, those of you that are watching. So the negative reinforcement is she pulls on the horse's halter and lead rope for some pressure. Every time the horse even leans forward, she releases some of the pressure. And so again, her timing is very important. And this was a horse that had never seen this tarp before. We did, um, I think, 34 horses and split them into two treatment groups. And if you're wondering why we have her facing the horse, that was done for a safety reason. Even though it might be more logical to have her just beside the horse, um, we simply didn't feel that was safe to do that. So that was, we did half of the horses in this manner, the negative reinforcement schedule. And, okay, now I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, here's a, a horse where we still have the negative reinforcement. We have to offer the cue that the horse is familiar with, but we couple it with positive reinforcement. So whenever this horse moves forward, it still gets the release of halter pressure, but it also gets a little bit of oats. And obviously, it's a little tricky because now you've just got the lead rope in one hand. 
Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about what we found in these two groups of horses after we get this horse over the tarp. So when we did this with our 34 horses, 17 in each group, all were horses that had not seen the tarp before, a um, couple interesting things came up. One was that actually the time to get the horses to cross was almost exactly equal between the two groups. And that was not quite what we expected to happen. Um, I actually expected that the horses where we added in the positive reinforcement would be faster to cross. But as I watched the videos over and over and over, in part, just, the, just taking the time to give a treat took some extra time. And so that definitely slowed up the process a little bit. We did see that the horses where we added in positive reinforcement were a little easier to keep calm as they were crossing the tarp. Oh, and let me look at this question real quick. Um, okay, Sarah Beth's question. If the horse ran off at the end, that horse would not have been given oats right at that point in time. Um, one thing that was kind of nice with the positive reinforcement, we usually didn't have the horses scamper like that because we could tend to slow them down in the process because when they would normally start to get scared is the first time they'd hear the crinkle of plastic. And so right as they were hearing that crinkle, we could usually give them a little bit of oats and kind of slow them down. Um, so that was one thing about using the positive reinforcement, it just seemed in general like it was safer for the handler. And the handler even got, so she almost dreaded when she had one of the horses coming up that was just going to be negative reinforcement. Whereas if it was positive, you know, she knew it was probably going to be a fairly safe situation. So something to think about when you're trying to teach horses, for example, to go into a horse trailer. Now, we had some people after this study say, yeah, but don't you think now the horses you trained with positive reinforcement are always going to have to have food in order to get them over this scary thing? So what we did is a year and a half later, we came back to this same task. We still had 14 of those horses on the farm that hadn't been sold. Um, and what we did with those horses is now we did the second time around, all of them just with negative reinforcement. So we thought, okay, this is the way the industry is most likely to do it. Just pull on the halter and rope. And what was really interesting is after a year and a half, the horses that were originally trained with negative plus positive reinforcement crossed much more quickly than they did the first time they were ever exposed to the study. Whereas the horses that had only been trained with negative reinforcement basically took exactly the same time, almost exactly, the second time around as they had the first time. So, you know, the sample size is not huge, only only 14 horses. Um, but as far as horse studies go, that's actually not a bad size. And statistically speaking, it was significant that these horses originally that got some food treats did much better the second time around. So that one was kind of interesting. The other thing we did as a follow-up to this study was we did almost the identical study with donkeys. Um, we had access to a group of 50 donkeys that were fairly close to campus. And when I first talked to the lady, um, she said, I don't think there's any way you're gonna get donkeys to cross this tarp. And I said, well, I said, let's, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Because one thing I should mention, if a horse or a donkey didn't cross after 10 minutes of consistent trying, um, we basically called that animal a failure, quote, unquote. And then we just went on to another animal. You know, if it was something like loading in a trailer that's going to affect the whole animal's life, obviously we would have had to push through and finish. But 
since we didn't consider that the tarp was going to be an obstacle that tons of these animals were going to see over and over, we went ahead and said, okay, this animal is a failure. We're not going to, this animal just didn't make it. But with the donkeys, negative reinforcement worked almost exactly the same way as it did with horses. But for some strange reason with the donkeys, the positive reinforcement didn't really seem to work quite the same way. So what we ended up doing with the donkeys was what's actually called luring, where we basically like hold a little pan of grain in front of them and shake it so they knew there was something there and we kind of bribed them to go forward. So again, kind of a subtle distinction. With positive reinforcement, the animal has to do something correct before it gets the food treat. With bribing or luring, you're trying to use the food treat to entice a behavior. So a fairly subtle difference there. A couple places you might want to look for some more information on this topic. Um, the International Society for Equitation Science is a group that's only been around for about five years. And it's a group that I'm a board member of. We have a number of people from England, Ireland, Netherlands, um, Australia that are involved in this association. And on that website, you can find some really good information about learning theory, as well as other things related to horse training and horse welfare. You know, in this country, calling it equitation science might seem a little bit odd because we think of equitation just as the show class. But the way they're using the term is more like in the classic um, Greek equitation way, basically just trying to do right by the horse, train them fairly, compete with them fairly. And so it's come, they've come up with some pretty interesting pieces of information. Another fairly basic book that um, you can order from any of the online sites, Equine Behavior, Principles and Practice, and it's reasonably inexpensive. I think it's around $30 and you can get used ones uh, for less than that. They have a full chapter on learning and training. And there's another book called Equine Behavior that is by Paul McGreevy. And that's another book. Um, it's actually not on this page. That one's more expensive. That one's more like $100. But if anybody needs the information on getting that book, um, you're more than welcome to email me and I will get that information to you. With that, I'm going to open it up so we have some time to um, answer questions. And while I'm waiting for questions to be typed in, um, I will mention on the Equitation Science website, the abstracts from the conferences that have been held so far are available. And some of them even have the full papers, but a number of them have the abstracts available. Um, some of the other studies we've done that are not directly related to learning theory are things like um, how much rain tension by different riders. And, okay, I do have a question here. When does clicker training get used for horses in training? And there are people that use clicker training for almost everything. They use it even for training under saddle tasks. They use it for training their horses in the barn manners. I personally still find clicker training probably most effective if you're trying to teach tricks. Um, it, it's something because it's so food-based that you almost need it to be a behavior that life would go on if the horse chose not to do that particular behavior at a particular moment. If you've ever watched a dolphin show, the dolphins are almost totally trained by clicker type training. Um, you've actually probably seen them with the whistles and the fish and so forth. But you've probably also seen a dolphin make a fool out of a person before because on a given day they've decided they're not going to do that certain behavior. And let me back up just a little bit to this other question here. Okay. All right. Um, question about would I give the food first and then say good boy or the other way around? I usually find it more effective 
if I say the verbal cue, good boy, good girl, and then immediately follow it with the food. Um, I do feel like the horse pretty soon after recognizes that verbal cue. Um, and if you're going to do the clicker training, you do the click, then the food. And one thing, um, there are some pretty good clicker training videos and DVDs out there. And there's a couple good websites. You know, if you just Google search clicker training horses, you can come up with some pretty good information. The other thing that's coupled fairly closely with clicker training is something called target training. Um, we did a little experiment with this at the farm last fall, basically as part of one of my classes I was teaching, and we would just use a white paper plate, and we would have the horse on a lead rope, and we'd say, touch it, and as soon as the horse accidentally, usually the first time, touched the paper plate, they would get a food treat. And it was amazing to me how quickly those horses would learn the command touch it. And you could put that plate pretty much anywhere. You could put it on the ground. You could put it up high. And they would lean forward and touch it so that they could get that little food treat. And my daughter and I have started using this with our one horse we're showing in halter classes this fall or this summer, trying to get her to touch and stretch her neck out to the tip of the whip. Because a lot of times when you're training Arabian halter horses, you almost have to be a little tough on them to get the expression. So we're trying to see if we can just do target training, teach her to touch the edge of the whip for a food treat. Um, and it actually seems to be working pretty well. Let me go back again a little bit to look at this last question. All right, if a horse is misbehaving, isn't open hand and it's handed slap appropriate? Okay, and I'm going to go against some of my colleagues, and I'm going to say in times that that is fine. You know, the horse is a big, powerful animal. If you watch how horses deal with each other, they're quite quick to bite at each other, or kick at each other, usually not with the goal of actually hurting the other animal, but they're very physical animals. Um, I don't necessarily think it is inappropriate to sometimes slap a horse. Now, it has to be done for the right reasons. Um, oh, Carissa, thank you. She's already got the website for some uh, clicker training information. And the, the clicker and target training is really fascinating. And even though I don't think it's like the be-all, end-all to horse training, I really think it is interesting and very educational to go through it and try to train a couple little tasks to a horse doing that. It really, really makes you work on your timing. It makes you think about learning theory. Um, and even if you elect to not do it with your horse, if you happen to have a dog, it's really fun to do some of the clicker and target training with a dog and just see how they think through the process. One thing I would mention um, with horses or dogs is different horses and dogs have different levels of motivation as it relates to food treats. Some horses and dogs are very food motivated and you can have fairly boring treats and they will still work pretty hard for that. Other animals, not very food motivated at all. And then you're going to have to have something just amazingly yummy to get very much of a reaction. All right. Has anyone done a study on reprimands? Oh, as far as if we were to reprimand in the same basic ways that a horse does. I can't think of ever seeing a study like that. Um, and Carissa, if you know of one, feel free to chime in on that. I think one thing that we're into at this point in time is the animal use committees at these various universities are extremely strict. And even if we say that we would like to conduct a study that is very typical of the industry, if we can't completely document why our study would be ethical and good welfare for the animal, chances are they're not going to approve that study. Um, 
and not necessarily that I'm dying to do studies where I have to potentially hurt animals, but some of the studies that would be interesting to know about might require some treatment that a lot of places would not be comfortable with. Let's see. All right, can I think of an example of does the horse get the option of making a correct choice? Um, I guess the one that comes to mind is if I'm asking a horse to lope or canter nicely, I want them to be going along slowly with collection, kind of staying at a consistent speed. And if the horse is still correct, it's, it's performing the canter in a nice soft way, but I continue to use my spurs and my bit on the horse, maybe because I personally want to confuse the horse a little bit, that's an example where I haven't given the horse a chance to be correct. Basically, no matter what the horse does, if they have a lousy canter, I'm going to go ahead and get after them. If they have a good canter, I'm going to go ahead and get after them. And if you go to a bunch of horse shows and you watch the warm-up pen, I can pretty much guarantee you will see some of that going on. Yeah, and the, the issue about where other horses are likely to reprimand, I, I think intuitively a lot of us are more likely to reprimand a horse in some of those same areas that a horse might, shoulder area, neck area, hindquarter area. Um, you know, very rarely do you see a horse bite another horse right on the nose. And so if we decide to smack a horse on the nose, that's not as horse typical. Any other questions that anybody has right now? Well, if you think of any questions later, um, you are more than welcome to email me and I will do my best to get a response to you as quickly as possible. And this is going to be archived. So if you do have other people that would like to see this, like the person that mentioned the Pony Club members, you know, that's, that's wonderful. In my mind, what I want to do is try to enhance fair horse training and good horse welfare. So the more we share this with, the better. Oh, I'll answer this last question, Amanda, before I have you um, sign off. Um, Laura, with this horse, is this just a horse that does this when it's bored? And I see this, this last question here is actually pretty interesting, so I am going to take one more after all. Um, do I think horses view us as predators? That one is really hard to know. Um, I don't necessarily think that horses view us as another horse. I think that would be a little confusing to a horse. Um, I do think we always have to be very cognizant of the fact that the horse thinks of itself as a prey animal. So the better that we can think like a prey animal, the more likely we can think like a horse and react appropriately. Um, and regarding the horse that's bored when it's nipping or when it's biting the lead line and so forth, a lot of horses do that. Um, and it kind of depends on the handler's level of tolerance. Quite honestly, I have one horse of my own that I do tolerate it chewing on the lead rope when I hold it for the farrier. It's just not something that bothers me a lot. If I'm working with one of the horses at the university, I basically don't tolerate any of that behavior because I know they're going to have a lot of different handlers. Um, okay, so Amanda, I am going to let you sign off. I will try to independently answer these last few questions that I got a little bit behind on. Okay, great. Well, with that, 
Um, I will say thank you so much, Dr. Lesky, for your presentation this afternoon, and um, especially thanks to all of you for participating and attending. Um, later this week, you will receive an invitation to participate in an online survey about today's webcast, and if you would take a few minutes to give us your feedback, that will really help us for future presentations. And on July 28th, My Horse University and the University of Minnesota will offer our third webcast in the Equine Genetics webcast series. The topic will be shivers and other muscular diseases, and it will be presented by Dr. Stephanie Valberg. So go to myhorseuniversity.com for details and to register for that webcast. And our monthly free webcasts will return in September, and the dates and topics will be available on our website soon, so be sure to check back for the fall lineup. And you can use the summer to catch up on any webcasts you may have missed by watching the recordings on our website. Also, My Horse University is now on Facebook, so become our fan if you haven't already to get the most up-to-date information on our events, courses, and more. And again, remember that the webcast was recorded and will be uploaded to our website by the end of the week, and you can send us your comments and suggestions to info at myhorseuniversity.com. Thanks again, and have a great day.